Sustainability Defined would like to thank Amaris for sponsoring this episode. To learn more about Amaris, go to amaris.com. That's A-M-Y-R-I-S dot com. All right, definers, welcome back to Sustainability Defined, where Scott and I are here defining sustainability, one concept and one bad joke at a time. This is episode 58 on biotechnology and sustainability. So, Scott, let's get right to it. What does this episode look like? All right, Jay, you've just had some freshly baked cookies from Miss Anna, and we are ready for the episode. <laughs> All right, so we're going to first talk about what is biotechnology. Then, why is biotech important? Third, what are some current applications of biotech and how can it advance sustainability? Then, are there any potential ramifications of pursuing biotech solutions? How can listeners learn more about biotechnology? And lastly, we'll give some background on Amaris and talk about our upcoming guests. All right, Jay, start from the basics. What is biotechnology? So, Scott, definers, (laughs) at its simplest, and as the name implies, Biotechnology is technology based on biology. So what that means is biotechnology harnesses cellular and biomolecular processes to develop technologies and products that improve our lives and the health of our planet. Agriculturalist Carl Arecki coined the term biotechnology way back in 1919, over 100 years ago, where he describes it as all lines of work by which products are produced from raw materials with the aid of living things. Jay, I hope before I die, I coin a term. That'd be cool. Scott, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to coin the term, but what do you think that the term might be in reference to? Is this like a new like brand of chocolate chip cookies since we're on topic? <laughs> or, or what is I'm going like to coin? a skateboard trick or what? Yeah. Uh, well, it's certainly not a skateboard trick. My <laughs> freshman year roommate at Georgetown was from California, tried to teach me to skateboard. I almost hurt myself horribly. I haven't done it since. So <laughs> moving along. One approach in modern biotechnology is modifying DNA and proteins to shape the capabilities of living cells, plants, and animals into something useful for humans. Biotechnologists do this by sequencing or reading the DNA found in nature and then manipulating it in a laboratory setting. Uh, But in general, keeping this in mind, biotechnology today is an applied science that utilizes living organisms and their derivatives in order to produce products and processes. Okay, Jay, so why is biotech important? So we don't want to sound too hyperbolic here, but biotechnology has shaped human civilization as we know it. In fact, Scott, biotechnology is nearly as old as humanity itself. So think about the food you eat and the pets you love. Judy. Even though Judy, and even though you just told me that you caught Delta, your cat, in the sink. uh, It's all right. I still love her. We still know you love her. You can thank our distant ancestors for kicking off the agricultural revolution using artificial selection for crops, livestock, and other domesticated animals. And biotech provides a way for us to utilize nature's manufacturing system to make the ingredients that go into any and all of our daily products, replacing certain ingredients that are scarce or have a significant environmental impact in their production with ones derived with biotechnology could have a significant impact because we're putting too big of a strain on our planet today. That's right, Scott. And consider how Earth Overshoot Day, which is the day that marks the date when humanity's demand for ecological resources and services exceeds what the Earth can regenerate in a year. It was August 20th last year. And and just consider that it tends to get earlier each year. Well, biotech provides a potential avenue to produce the products we need with inputs that put less strain on the Earth. And since these biotech substitutes could take off in use, there's a large biotech market today, and it's expected to grow in the future. Today, the market size, as measured by revenue of biotech in 2020, it was over $100 billion. But looking to the future, the global biotech market expected to reach $775 billion by 2025. That's huge growth. Crazy growth. All right, so Jake, what are current applications of biotech, and how do they advance sustainability? So we are going to categorize these applications and highlight their connections to sustainability within three big buckets, human health, food, and fuel. So there's more, but these are our buckets, right, Jay? Exactly. So this is how we're going to frame it today. 
So first bucket is human health. The Future of Life Institute notes that biotechnology is present in our lives before we're even born, from fertility assistance to prenatal screening to the home pregnancy test. Follows us through childhood with immunizations and antibiotics, both of which have drastically improved life expectancy. Biotechnology is a key driver behind disease vaccines. Biotech-powered vaccines have eliminated smallpox, polio, and other deadly diseases, and they even have the potential to eradicate non-communicable diseases like cancer. Hmm. And another example under biotech, sustainability and human health, is squalene. What is squalene? I'm sure many are asking. I was wondering this too. Aside from being a fun word to say, squalene Hmm. is an oily compound found in shark livers that has been shown to boost the effectiveness of vaccines. As you can imagine, this is a big draw to many pharmaceutical companies, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. But we can't harvest squalene from sharks at the rate we need and scale the pharma industry without further endangering the species. Between 63 million and 273 million sharks die at the hands of humans each year, and liver oil is harvested from at least a couple million of them. So here comes biotech with a potential way to get the immunity benefit without needing to harm sharks in the process. Amaris is using its biotech platform to develop squalene that doesn't require a single shark. Currently, the company can produce enough squalene to produce 1 billion vaccines in only a month. Jay, I think sharks might be a cool episode at some point. I can't wait, Scott. I know we talk about this in the interview. Because you love sharks, right? I love sharks. I mean, even, you know, of course, like, we can talk movies like The Jaws and Uncaged, but... Man, I'm just going to cut myself off before we make this intro way too long. But even beyond the pop culture, like important role in nature, there's a lot of harm being done, a lot of interesting issues to unpack. So maybe we could do it at one point, but go ahead. Very true. And and Scott, I I do follow actually a a handle called Discover Sharks on Instagram, and they're actually pretty good about showing all the ways sharks are endangered, right? It's it's, Mm. it's actually a real crisis. So I think it's, it's a very topical point to bring up here. Yeah. Okay. So that's our first bucket, human health, as far as current applications of biotech. Now let's take a look at our second, which is biotech's connection to food. So the majority of the food we eat comes from engineered plants. These plants are modified either via modern technology or by more traditional artificial selection to grow without pesticides, to require fewer nutrients, or to withstand the rapidly changing climate. Because crops can be modified faster through biotechnology than by conventional agriculture, Biotechnology can hasten the implementation of strategies to meet food challenges as they relate to rapid and severe climactic changes. Pest and disease-resistant biotech crops have been continuously improved as new pests and diseases emerge with changes in climate. Additionally, biotech crops allow farmers to practice soil carbon sequestration. For example, herbicide-tolerant soybean and canola crops facilitate zero or no-till farming practices. These practices significantly reduce the loss of soil carbon, and therefore carbon stays sequestered in the soil. Jay, let's give a shout out to episode 47 on soil carbon, so people can check that out. Uh When we have a reduction in the loss of soil carbon, that also reduces CO2 emissions, fuel use, and soil erosion. Other applications of agricultural biotech as they relate to climate change include salinity-tolerant crops, drought-resistant crops, and crops with bolstered cold and heat stress tolerance. Okay. Those are buckets one and two. Let's kick over bucket three, shall we? Mm. Let's start with biomass. Biomass is renewable organic material that comes from plants and animals, such as wood and agricultural crops. Biomass can be converted directly into liquid fuels called biofuels to help meet transportation fuel needs. The two most common types of biofuels in use today are ethanol and biodiesel. Ethanol is most commonly derived from corn, sugar cane, and sugar beets, thanks to right shroot. And biodiesel <laughs> is produced from vegetable oils, yellow grease, used cooking oils, or animal fats. Yellow grease. I have no idea what that. Uh, why is it yellow? <laughs> I don't know, and I don't, I guess I just don't really want to know. <laughs> yeah, let's just keep on going. So <laughs> these two food-based fuels represent the first generation of biofuel technology. This first generation is pretty substantial, too. For example, in 2019, 10% of U.S. vehicle fuel consumption by volume was ethanol, and over 98% of U.S. gasoline contains ethanol. The second generation of biofuels are made from non-food sources. This is important, since some argue that the footprint of producing the food for fuel is not worth it. 
So the U.S. Department of Energy's Bioenergy Technologies Office is collaborating with industry to develop next-generation biofuels made from cellulosic, meaning fibers from plant cells, and algae-based resources. So truly, biofuels could be a topic in and of itself, so don't be surprised if we cover them in the future. All right, so Scott, we talked about our three buckets of biotech and how we're categorizing them. Mm -hmm. Here's a quick party fact alert for you definers. We have other quite intriguing potential applications of biotech, including bomb-sniffing plants and helping facilitate the resurrection of the woolly mammoth. There is no joke there, folks. Those are those are real applications. Hmm. Okay. Had to fit those in. Had to fit those in. Now, of course, as we're talking about things like resurrecting the woolly mammoth, it probably makes sense to discuss complications with biotech. Also important to fit in. <laughs> right. And understand just the different angles around this concept. Of course, this is a big, complex topic that raises important questions. As the Biotechnology Innovation Organization puts it, biotechnology can provide useful tools for combating disease, hunger, climate change, and environmental contamination, but it should not be viewed as a panacea, as in something that can solve all of our problems. For example, life-saving medicines may have serious side effects and... While our expanding knowledge of genetics can help create the next generation of medicines, its potential for misuse requires ethical assessment. And actually, definers, one side note. We are only going to touch on environmental and societal implications of biotech without diving too deeply into religious or spiritual ethics concerns, as these viewpoints are often very personal. Jay, I have to think there's like uh, Judaism and biotech. (laughs) We could... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we could look into. Mm-hmm. Okay, so one of the biggest complications when it comes to biotechnology is the idea of unforeseen effects. An example here is mosquito control. Scientists are exploring a biotech-powered strategy to control mosquito populations, since they're known to be carriers of harmful and deadly pathogens and seem to play no productive role in the ecosystem. Their approach is to genetically alter and destroy disease-carrying species of mosquitoes. Sounds great for those who love camping, like Jay and I. (laughs) Now, scientists who work on this approach, called the gene drive, have performed risk assessments and equipped them with safeguards to make the trials as safe as possible. But since this man-made gene drive has never been tested in the wild, it's impossible to know for certain the impact that a mosquito extinction could have on the environment. Additionally, there's a small possibility that the gene drive could mutate once released in the wild, spreading genes that researchers never planned for. And that's something I've heard with like genetically altered things in general, Jay, that there could be this mutation with things in the wild. And Scott, I got to be honest, whenever I hear the phrase, you know, genetically mutated, I think of X-Men. Does that happen to you? No, but that makes sense. That's fair. (laughs) Uh, Maybe that's how it was like uh, inspired. Stan Lee, right, was the guy that he just, he read about biotech and was like, X-Men, done. Definers, stay tuned for an upcoming episode on sustainability and the X-Men. By the way, one thing on mosquitoes, we did link in the notes to an episode from Radiolab about mosquitoes and this whole idea of like killing them off with mutations. So check that out. It's really good. Okay. So Scott, keeping us moving here, the International Service for the Acquisition of Agrobiotech Applications, that is a mouthful, articulates two additional complications (laughs) worth considering as well. The first idea is of general welfare and sustainability emphasizing that while a technology can provide more food, it should not be to the detriment of the environment or to human health or disrupt traditional behavioral systems. As an environmental issue, questions raised have to do with concerns regarding environmental protection, sustainable use of biodiversity, economic growth, and social equity. A second question involves the distribution of benefits and burdens as a result of biotechnology. A central question here is whether the products produced by the technology will be able to provide for those who really need them and whether they will generate wealth for the society as a whole as opposed to furthering global inequality, which we know is a rising issue. Another issue is that a company could own the beneficial technology and wield it to charge high prices or take advantage of people. So we like Monopoly of the game. We don't like Monopoly in this (laughs) sense. (laughs) There are also concerns that government regulators do not have a rigorous enough framework in place to test these new biotech-derived products and ensure their safety before they go to market. But on the whole, we can say that the majority of the public is optimistic about the ability of biotechnology to improve our quality of life. Per Hofstra University, 79% 
of the people they interviewed said that biotechnology has had a positive effect on the quality of healthcare and that biotechnology and related sciences have made life easier. And I imagine that number will go up if mosquitoes go away because of biotech. <laughs> okay, so how can definers and perhaps mosquitoes as well learn more about biotechnology? Well, as you've probably put together, biotechnology is a huge field with a wide array of applications and subspecialties. It's therefore difficult to point to a single place to learn more on any given component of biotechnology. Right. We recommend starting with organizations that study biotech from a societal lens before diving into specific areas of focus. We like the Future of Life Institute. We actually used a fair bit of their, their material for our intro notes. It's a nonprofit organization that works to understand and mitigate existential influences impacting society. It does a nice job of introducing the field of biotechnology and its potential societal benefits and risks. It also links to a ton of resources from books and research papers to TED Talks and other leading organizations. We'll link to these in our show notes. ETC Group is another organization to check out. They work to address the socioeconomic and ecological issues surrounding new technologies that could have an impact on the world's poorest and most vulnerable people. If you like the work they do, you can even donate to them directly. All right, our last section here, everybody, this is about Amaris and our upcoming guests from that company. So Amaris, it's a biotech company based in Emeryville, California. Also happens to be where Pixar is located. Jay, <laughs> favorite Pixar movie, go. Oh, boy. I, I, You know what, Scott? We've talked about this. I've gotten so much heat recently because I happened to fall asleep during the movie Soul, which apparently oh. was really awesome. Yeah. But as far as all-time favorites go with Pixar, oh, I got to go Toy Story. How about you? Mm, I think I got to go Up. Okay. You and Anna would... would share that in common I freaking love that movie uh there's just so many touching scenes when he oh when he gives them the memory book and she, she says go have your own adventure oh my goodness it breaks my I heart think I'm, i think i'm due for a rewatch oh and the um thing at the five minute thing at the beginning it the montage it's cinematic brilliance okay so <laughs> amorous is helping to realize a more sustainable future with its platform for converting sustainably sourced sugarcane into natural and pure ingredients these ingredients are then used in biopharmaceutical drug discovery and production, cosmetic and skincare lines, health and wellness, flavors and fragrances, and more. Amaris owns six consumer-facing brands. It also partners with a number of companies across industries to help make their formulations more sustainable. Here are just a few teasers on how Amaris is helping to bring new sustainable products to market. In fact, Amaris has a number of consumer-facing brands, some of which you might already be familiar with. The first one is Biosance, a clean skincare line that you might see in your Instagram feed or on the shelves of your local Sephora. Next is Pipette, a safe and sustainable line of skincare for babies and mothers. And finally, you have Purecane, a no-calorie sweetener. There are several other brands in the Amherst family and a few new brands being launched this year, like the hair care brand that is developing with Jonathan Van Ness, who, Scott, I know you and I both just love. But... Those are just a few that we'll share with you for now, so stay tuned for more. Jay, favorite Queer Eye, go. Well, Scott, are we talking like character or episode? Like the guy, of the guys. Who's your favorite? Oh, man. That <laughs> is such an impossible question. But Scott, you know what? As I am reckoning with my own hair loss, which definers have probably <laughs> traced, I got to go Karamo. I mean, he's my guy. Really? Wow. Yeah. How about you? Okay. Well, I mean, I love Anthony because, I mean, he is cute. Uh, but I think I love Bobby. So much respect for Bobby because he knows his stuff. He makes, he just makes brilliant interior design. So I, I give it to Bobby. I, I gotta say, Ann and I just crack up because while Bobby is working his butt off, renovating exactly. an entire house, Anthony, exactly. you know, goes, goes to the grocery store. He gets an avocado. He gets a pepper. Uh, yeah. And then he, he makes them tasty and then wipes his hands. And says, All right, cool. I'm done. <laughs> right. And that's why Bobby is my favorite. He, he does, Great he puts in the work. So Great I'm just answer. a good guy. All right. So all of these brands and product lines are developed using Amherst's proprietary biotech platform that uses fermentation, not petroleum-based manufacturing, to make these products. All right. So we're going to be speaking with two folks from Amherst, John Mello and Beth Bannerman. John is the director, president, and CEO of Amherst. That's a nice trio of titles. Quite. He has, yeah. He has 30 years of combined experience as an entrepreneur and thought leader in developing growing technology companies. John has led Amherst through successful technology development, industrial startup, product development, and commercialization. He was also at the helm during a number of funding rounds, including the initial public offering. 
Beth is the Chief Engagement and Sustainability Officer at Amaris. Beth leads an integrated team to introduce the company's first environmental, social, and governance report as a part of the company's commitment to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Scott, this is a great conversation coming up. Let's get right to it. A CEO and CSO. Let's do it. All right, Definers, we have made it to our interview portion of our biotechnology and sustainability episode. With us, we have two very esteemed guests. We have John Mello, the president and CEO of Amaris, and we have Beth Bannerman, the chief engagement and sustainability officer at Amaris. Intimidating title. Some incredible titles. John and Beth, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, nice to be here. Pleasure to be here, Jay. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Us too. All right. So let's get right to it. So for each of you, could you just briefly introduce yourselves? I think we gave the listeners a a tease as we transitioned into this interview, but tell us about yourselves and what led your professional background to arrive at Amherst. I'm the Chief Engagement and Sustainability Officer at Amherst. Uh, My job really is to, to connect people to what we're doing, to what Amherst is doing, help people understand it engage them in a way that inspires them and gives them hope about the future and give them something to really kind of something really good to believe in. So an important part of my role is to lead sustainability. And that includes the production of our first ever ESG report this year. Um, And that really just shows that sustainability at Amaris is not nice to have. It's a business driver. And um, the report will bring transparency to everything we do, give our customers and everyone really more reason to believe that our organization is a real force for good and that we're definitely committed. I would say that that's really what brought me to Amherst, uh, this passionate and energized group of brilliant and talented people. They're all working together to create sustainable ingredients for everyday products that perform better than non-sustainable versions. They cost less in terms of its price. But they also cost less in terms of its impact on the environment. And um, before Amaris, I was living in the UK, leading communications at a large financial services company. And after the financial collapse, I was just looking for something more meaningful. I had a friend in London who introduced me to John and I heard about what he was doing. And when I met him, I was really inspired and made me want to join the team. And that was 2018. And here I am. Fantastic. And so, John. The connecting piece with Amaris and Beth here, what is your backstory and what led you to Amaris? Great, Jay. And let me start by saying it is so great that we were able to get Beth out of just doing green, like putting money out there to actually making green, (laughs) green. So I'm so glad we were able to achieve that. Prior to being here, I was with BP, the uh, British oil company, uh, and um, spent about 10, 11 years there. And one of my first big projects there was really helping the company think differently about the future. And I I led a piece of work around uh, rebranding the company after the merger with Amica, which included repositioning the company to take it beyond petroleum, including a a tagline that got criticized at the time. Uh, You know, how could an oil company go beyond petroleum? But we meant it. We were serious about it. And, uh, And we had a CEO who was really passionate about a more sustainable future for our planet. So that's where I was before here. And then I got a call from uh, 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 John Doerr and then uh, met with John Doerr and Al Gore. And their their mission was to convince me that I should uh, leave BP and come join them on this crazy mission to uh, develop a great anti-malarial product and then take the technology that uh, was capable of saving a million children a year and then reposition it to really focus on making renewable fuels. And that's the start. We obviously ended up being in a different place, uh, but that's how I started. And my passion was really after meeting the scientists here, not really understanding the science well at the beginning, but really being passionate about the idea that we could save a million children and hopefully along the way, make our planet better. Uh, so that's, that's how I started. And I've been passionate since I thought it would be a quick thing. I thought I'd uh, be here for three, four years, take the company public and then go on to my next gig. And 15 years later, here I am, uh, full of gray hair, full of scars, <laughs> but having survived actually creating a real uh, and pioneering a real transformative technology for our, for our planet. 
Wow. Well, I will say we were on video right before we started, and you looked good. So I don't know. What <laughs> I, we're I don't about know. Scars, I know. That's, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you're not seeing well, and I'm glad my camera <laughs> was a bit uh, a bit gray. <laughs> It's because of all the, the beauty products that we make. They're awesome. Ah, there we go. And and Scott, John mentioned getting a casual call from Al Gore. I haven't received one of those. I don't know if you have. <laughs> Not yet. Okay. Um, Remain but sexy. I will say, I think, Beth, you, I like your title, but making green green might need to be just your new title or your, <laughs> your own tagline on your business card because that's good. Maybe, uh, that, maybe but, yeah. Should I get a jingle? Like, it's not easy being green or maybe that one's already been taken by Kermit, right? <laughs> there you go. So, John, you bring up how you started in one place and you've ended in another. And I'm actually reading a book right now called Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, The Difference and Why It Matters by Richard Rumelt. And as I read more about Amaris's story, right, where you were a bit more focused on biofuels and renewable energy. Now it's more about developing sustainable specialty ingredients, right? So, I'd love to hear more about that transition. And was there like an aha moment where you're like, okay, biofuels and renewable energy are great, but actually over here is really where we can make a difference. And what were the lessons learned as you made that strategy pivot? Great question, Scott. Look, and I'm, I, as you can imagine, there's a lot of pivots along the way, right? The idea that there's a single pivot, I think is a bit mm -hmm. of a misnomer. It's like, the mm -hmm. only reason there's a single pivot is that's the, that's the one people remember and the one that probably gets you on track. But you're just constantly sure. adjusting. And I, I'd say the thing you don't adjust is you're North Star. Like, what, what is our purpose? Why are we here? And then you don't, you, don't, you don't really adjust the basic principles, like the guardrails on the road. But then the road is as windy as it needs to be, because as, as a company and in a mindset, you really have to be nimble. You have to adapt. You have to adjust to changing context uh, and, uh, and the changing learnings, right? If you really are. Mm -hmm. innovating, if you really are pioneering, you're going to learn a lot along the way. I mean, by its nature, innovation and pioneering is not about, I've got it all figured out. It's actually about, I've got an idea and I've got this thing that I think works really well, but I have no clue what it's really going to do. And uh, you end up actually, again, just iterating your way to success. And every iteration, like when you're on the inside, feels like, you know, a redirection. But again, you're not changing an North Star and you're, you're straight. And so what, what drives that? And what are some of those guardrails? And like, I'll, I'll tell you the main one for me, or, or maybe two, like the first is mm -hmm. being committed from the beginning to really help accelerate the world's transition to sustainable consumption, which for me really is about in everything a consumer buys, ensuring that we're moving or, or removing the crap, right? I don't want bad chemistry. I don't want <laughs> toxic stuff. I don't want stuff yeah. that you use. And when you wash it off your body and goes down the drain, actually pollutes our water system. So kind of re realizing that you move the world one molecule at a time. And those molecules are chemistry that shows up in stuff people consume every day from detergent to perfumes, to, to makeup, to some of the foods we we eat, like it's everything has the possibility of being made better through biology. Where so that whole notion for me is the beginning. Underneath that notion is a belief, a strong belief I have that to get people to switch, you have to be no compromise, meaning you got to remove the barriers. You have to be as good with sustainability as whatever they use that they think is best in their lives. Secondly, you can't make it more expensive. And then thirdly, you have to really work hard to make the whole chain sustainable so it's the most sustainable. When you do those three things, I can share with you over and over experience where when you do those three things, the product always wins. And we have a track record of that. But I'll tell you, for us, we had to navigate our way there. We had to figure our way there. And we, we initially wanted to do it with fuel because, you know, fuel moves people it provides freedom right it's the, it's it's uh it's what it's what moves commerce right so we wanted fuel to be the place we can influence and affect everybody around the world and the reality is with shale oil changing the macro environment for the outlook of oil prices and the world not not uh, having the courage to establish a true price or cost of carbon it makes it really hard to compete with the new technology because at the end of the day the no compromise promise has to work, right? And we couldn't deliver a fuel that was 
uh, competitive on price. We delivered a fuel that was hmm. the best performing in the market. We delivered a fuel that was the uh, most sustainable in the market, but it didn't hit that second part of the no compromise promise of being uh, competitive on price. So we couldn't make it work. And, but because we went after the hardest problem, making fuel, we were able to, to shift and apply the technology to many other markets where we now are making a huge impact and really making life better. No, I mean, it sounds like an exciting place to work, an exciting challenge. And you mentioned the three elements here of being competitive on price, uh, cutting out the crap, you know, making it actually sustainable and across the whole value chain. So I guess that takes me to what is your focus and your secret sauce here of, of concentrating on sugarcane? I mean, you talked about talking to your scientists and that in part led to making the move towards where you are now. So can you talk to us more about how the sugarcane that you're sourcing, that you're turning into the products that you make, how it hits on those three elements? Yeah, look, uh, in fermentation, the feedstock matters a lot. I mean, it's the raw material that you're actually using through fermentation to make all this exciting chemistry. So our whole idea is, whether it's an anti-malarial product, whether it's squalene to go into uh, vaccines currently, or whether it's you know perfume, cosmetics, or the key, the key ingredient that gives tide its scent. We do all of those things, but they all start with one simple thing, the feedstock that goes into fermentation. So the feedstock matters a lot. So when, because it matters a lot, my whole thing with feedstock was really about sustainability and cost. We needed to have a feedstock that was the lowest cost in the world over time, not just a moment. It had to be uh, non-GMO because the feedstock affects the final product. And I don't want to deal with a consumer barrier around potential GMO in the final product. And thirdly, uh, it had to be uh, the most sustainable uh, source of feedstock. So lowest cost, non-GMO, most sustainable. And sugarcane from Brazil specifically, not sugarcane from Australia, because that uses irrigation, not sugarcane from India, because that uses a lot of inputs. I needed something that didn't use fertilizer, that did not use uh, irrigation, that basically just used nature. And, and John, are you saying Brazil in Brazil, they just use rainwater? That's correct. Wow. So I'm, I'm curious, we're talking about the inputs using sugarcane why it's it's sustainable for the reasons we talked about you know there, there's just less fertilizer intensive irrigation that's that's helping grow the sugarcane that amaris is using but let's let's stop and, and just help us understand this question and we of course know that you guys yourselves are not phds or scientists but could you walk me and scott and our definers through the basics of how amaris's platform and how it how its process works. You take sugarcane and you turn that into all these different products. In a nutshell, how does that happen? Yeah, look, I'll, I'm going to give you like a really simple explanation and then I'll give you a more of a technical explanation, okay? Uh, and the, the real simple one actually comes from uh, my largest shareholder, John Doerr, who was so passionate about making our planet better with me since day one because, you know, he, he is so passionate about the future of our planet and wants the technology to thrive. And when he explains it, it's literally, this is really great technology. You take bugs, you feed them carbon from sugarcane, and they eat the carbon from sugarcane, and they poop great chemicals. <laughs> That's actually what's going on, right? Now, there's a lot of little details, right? So the way everything starts, uh, like the well, little critters are yeast. So we like yeast. Yeast is a real, a real workhorse as an organism. And yeast has been around for a couple of thousand years, right? Doing everything from bread to wine to beer, right? So, but yeast naturally likes to make alcohol. So what we do, we've created a ton of software and a ton of artificial intelligence to let the scientists program a natural language what the scientist wants the yeast to do. That all gets translated then into DNA. So it, basically, uh, if you take the code ACTG, and you, and you organize the code, just like you'd organize one and zeros in programming a, bro a browser, we literally translate the scientist's request of natural language into the specific sequence of DNA, put it into yeast, add the right genes and the right enzymes, and then we get the yeast to do exactly the work of a big chemical factory, 
but do it in a fermentation tank in a natural and sustainable way to take the sugarcane juice and make it into the exact chemistry we want. And we do that better than anybody in the world. And then we basically take that yeast. Uh, and then once it's doing what we want, it's, it's converting the carbon from the sugarcane syrup into the exact chemistry at the right cost, at the right purity level. We put it in big tanks, we feed it lots of sugarcane juice, and uh, out the other end comes amazing chemistry. You better hope that all these yeasts, they don't organize and demand more money because it sounds like you're working them pretty hard. You know what? We work the shit out of the yeast that I am sure happy they don't have a union. <laughs> Look, I, I have to tell you, uh, uh, David Botstein, a, a professor from uh, Princeton who was actually uh, the uh, head of R&D uh, at Genentech for a long time, he was a great mentor of mine. Uh -huh. And he always told me, John, all I want you to think about, I want you to focus on one simple thing. Keep the yeast happy. As long as <laughs> yeast are happy, they will work the shit out for you, which is exactly what occurs. <laughs> and you keep them happy by temperature. You know, you don't get too hot. You don't make too cold. You feed them well. You don't stress them. And when you do that, the freaking yeast are like the best productivity tool in the world. And they're pretty cheap. Like it's the best flavor <laughs> you could buy. Well, I don't know what's in this ESG report, but Beth, I feel like there's some really good graphics that could be created <laughs> with this stuff. And I just think, that employers everywhere, John, could take that recipe of, you know, keeping them happy, keeping the temperature right, giving them good food. I mean, that's a recipe yeah. for a, a fantastic workforce, <laughs> whatever kind of company you're in. Right. So this is all, I get it. You keep the yeast happy. You guys can make all these applications. My understanding is your three main markets, clean beauty, health and wellness, flavors and fragrances. Feel free to tell us about one of those applications. But I want to go to you know, John, you're saying it's really important where you source the sugar cane from. Like it's got to be Brazil because of the the inputs they use, the way they the, they use the rainwater. So let's say that this stuff blows up, right? And your applications go crazy. I mean, what is can you sustainably source enough sugar cane to to scale this? And you know, is the, is that a is that an issue that you guys maybe see down the road? Yeah, look, I'll, I'll use one application uh, as an example. Uh, think about Sao Paulo State as the largest producer of sugarcane in the world, right? Uh, and then Brazil as a whole, beyond Sao Paulo State, is the largest exporter of sugar in the world, right? They export about half the sugar they produce outside of Brazil. Um, and they are, they're big consumers, right? So where sugarcane is used today is to make ethanol for motor vehicles, which, you know, I hope very quickly, a decade or less, uh, we end up going electric for transport, which means we have to find a different use for that sugar cane anyway. And then secondly, uh, you know, there's the demand for sugar is flattened. And I hope it declines really through the use of our natural sweetener and many other uh, natural sweeteners that consumers are shifting to. So I, I think there's a move that's just going to make more and more cane available for us that are based on mega trends. Uh, over time. So I'm not worried about the cane, but I want to give you a specific application. So uh, we make the best performing moisturizer in the world, which actually serves two purposes. It's a great moisturizer for skin, but it's also the best carrier of actives into your system beyond, beyond the skin layer, uh, the, the surface layer of your skin. It's also a great lipid for vaccines to carry actives into your blood system. It's an amazing molecule. It's called squalane. It also has a derivative called squalene that's used in the vaccine side. Squalane was originally sourced from shark liver oil. And today, based on the amount of volume we produce of squalane and then soon squalene, uh, you know, we're saving somewhere between two to three million sharks a year. Those two to three million sharks that we're saving basically are the equivalent, when you think about sugarcane, as about 10% of Central Park of sugarcane to save two to three million sharks a year. I hope, I hope that gets you to visualize the real difference that fermentation and using synthetic biology, the biotechnology of the industrial, uh, of the industrial revolution, kind of helps you visualize how impactful it is. The footprint and the amount of sugarcane needed to make amazing chemistry that actually serves millions of consumers around the world is so small compared to the impact we're having on nature for extracting those things. 
Yeah. So I guess what you're saying is that there is some land that's needed for sugarcane, right? And there probably is some resource use to make that happen. But the impact that results from the way in which you're using the sugarcane more than outweighs that land use and that that footprint of making the sugarcane. Is that right? Exactly. It's almost, uh, and the, the, these ratios are not right, but uh, you know, it's almost like you're reducing land use by at least 10x by making the product through fermentation versus its current source. I think another way of looking at it is um, kind of on a smaller scale is if you think about an eight by 10 size rug, um, you, we need that much sugar cane to create one kilogram of squalane, which equals about three sharks. It's another good infographic, Beth. Just saying. <laughs> I, I see it. <laughs> I just got to say, I love sharks. And if I had known sharks would be so present in this conversation, I would have been even more excited than I already was. And I know a lot of listeners out there too. I mean, I just love sharks. I love that we're talking about them. <laughs> okay, so let's transition now. So we've got this understanding by way of these helpful examples. Thank you both for providing those of Amherst's process, its products, and how what it does is able to move these different industries closer to real sustainable progress. Now, let's now focus on Amherst as a corporate entity. So Beth, we mentioned in the intro that you are currently leading Amherst through its very first ESG report as a part of the company's commitment to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Question is, what does your commitment to these UN SDGs mean to Amherst? And is the company involved with any other organizations seeking to solidify standards for sustainability? Yeah, our commitment to the, the UN Sustainability Development Goals is just another way that we're continuing to put sustainability first as part of our core business strategy. Our vision is to move the world to sustainable ingredients and clean manufacturing. And this is just one part of the puzzle. Everyone has a shared responsibility, right? We're all sharing this planet to do what they can. So this is what we can do to achieve real change. There's two organizations that come to mind that I could, could share with you. One is the Environmental Working Group. This is an independent group that we work with to verify our consumer products are clean, meaning that they don't include toxic ingredients. And the other organization is called Bonsupro. That's a great organization as well. And we are the first biotechnology company to receive Bonsucro certification. We announced that back in December 2020. And what that means is that our sugarcane is all fair trade, ethically produced, and sustainable. It's all fair trade. Yeah. That's awesome. And now, Beth, I'm curious. So so it's so exciting to be able to take a company of Amherst's stature through this for the very first time. I have to imagine you're learning new things and and putting together so many new pieces in the process. So I'm curious, what have you learned from this first go through and how do you think that's going to ultimately inform the future direction of Amherst as a company? Yeah, we're learning a lot. We can't share too much yet. We're going to be publishing later this year, but so far it's been an awesome experience. Uh, terrific opportunity to examine what are the issues that our stakeholders care about most. Mm -hmm. you know, um, before the show, you, we were talking a little bit about kind of the complexity of reporting on ESG standards. Uh, we found mm -hmm. that there's more than 300 different standards that companies can be measured on. So we were able to whittle down that list into the topics that our customers care about most, that our investors care about most, and what our competitors are doing, but really putting our customers at the forefront. By whittling that down, that list of 300 down to about 15 areas to really kind of focus on where we can drive our energy forward mo is motivating because you feel like what you're going to be working on is really going to matter. Um, but in the end, um, you know, really what's important is that our customers trust that we're on this journey with them, um, that we're not afraid to be transparent about where we are. You know, it, our changes that we're going to make are, are not going to happen overnight. Um, this is not about putting out a press release. This is about a long-term kind of commitment to um, kind of making the world a better place, um, investing uh, our time and energy and our teams for all the right reasons. Like what we're doing is really worth it. Um, you know, it's a cliche, but look, it's good for people, good for the planet, good for business. Um, and I'm really looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to the ESG report being finished, working with John and the executive team to set out big, audacious sustainability goals together and then going after them together. I like that feeling yeah. of being in it together for a good cause. So it's 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 exciting. Well, yeah, kudos to you for going on that journey uh, to put all of your 
impacts in one place in this report and and see where it takes you as well. Maybe turn over stones you hadn't before. And and that makes me want to go to looking ahead now. So this is really for John or Beth. Uh, as you all think about what you've done with your ESG report and your experience, like John, you said, you guys have had to pivot several times. Is there any part of the sustainability commitments you've made or you're thinking about making, or as you think about, as we were talking about earlier, scaling up where you're at, some of your applications go bigger, or as you come up with new applications and those hit that keep you up at night that you're, you're nervous about? Talk to us about the future and, and what is maybe giving you some heartburn in terms of, man, I, we want to achieve this from a sustainable perspective, but we're not sure how. Yeah, look, um, the reality is that Amherst right now is in hyper growth, not just high growth. And con considering how fast we're growing, we need to be able to set goals that are going to be just out of our reach. Uh, we want to make sure mm. that the, the goals are ambitious enough. Um, and if we think we can attain them easily, then they're probably not bold enough. So I'm, I'm less concerned about um, achieving big goals because we've got the teams that are set up and um, to do it and they're and they're passionate about about doing that. I think I think if there was one concern that I would have, it's really about the the future being unknown. We've got a learning curve. We've never done this before. Um, yeah. And so but like John was saying at the start, right, he's a fundamentalist. And as long as we stick to our guiding principles, I think we're going to um, we're going to get there. We're going to we're, we're we're already doing the right thing. So it's just a matter of uh, measuring it, being transparent about it, and then staying the course. Yeah, I'll I'll add and say, you know, one of my principles that uh, you know sometimes gets investors uh, pushing back is a simple one, which is look, when we find a great ingredient, uh, we have made it available to the rest of the world, not just our own brands, and we do that because we really believe that a rising tide raises all ships. Which means that if we're going to achieve sustainability for our planet, we need everybody to actually move in that direction. So what worries me is that, you know, we still have a lot of people on the fence. We still have a lot of people that, you know, kind of give lip service and greenwash. And mm -hmm. I just want I want to move like for us to be super impactful. Our, the industries we play in have to move with us. And when we do that, consumers are better off and our planet's better off. So what worries me are the laggards who still are in denial and really mm. uh, don't don't look at doing right as a priority. Well, John, I think if we find those laggards, all we got to do is send them this conversation and hopefully that just pushes them right over the fence into the direction we want them to go. But I do think that's a fantastic point that, you know, there's such a participatory element to all of this that it's it's this we're in it together approach that that I think is really fantastic. Now we're talking big goals. We're talking big thoughts. How about just what's upcoming for Amherst over the next six to 12 months? Uh, in addition to, I, I have to draw a reference to something we mentioned in the intro, which is a hair care brand with Jonathan Van Ness, who is, who is me and my fiance is just absolute favorite. So we're pumped for that one, but what else is coming up over the next six to 12 months? Uh, look, Jay, you, you hit one of my favorite ones only because, you know, I have the advantage of uh, trying all formulas first. Oh, and so you. I, I become addicted to uh, the hair products that we're developing for Jonathan Van Esso. And, and I love going after hair because hair has such a negative impact on everybody. Like, you know, here's a great example. Acne, back acne, especially in China, but really in many parts of the world is becoming a really serious issue because people are using toxic products and shampoos that are actually then going to the back and creating acne. That's like, that's crazy. Why the hell would we do that? Right. And then more importantly, think about like how often we wash our hair and how much of that bad crap goes down the drain and affects our water system. Right. So yeah. I'm, I'm so passionate about hair and I think the products there are going to be awesome. Uh, and Jonathan Vanessa has been like super, super engaged and he is so passionate. Like he doesn't let us get away with anything. And he, he wants to raise the bar even more for these. So that's exciting. I think what we're doing with Rosie Huntington Whiteley and actually going after color, uh, everything from lip from lipstick to mascara, it's anything you put on your body that adds color to your body. Like color is a place that's horrible. Color cosmetics, like color is awful. And yet people put it on their skin thinking they're making themselves look pretty on the outside, but the base of those products actually destroy our skin. So going after making color uh, safe and more importantly, uh, really good for our planet is another big thing that we're when we're launching both of these in August. So I, I see the second half of this year 
as the most exciting period in, our, in the life of our company. And then in June, we're launching a product that I, I feel not only will be good for our planet, but I think will be good for the soul. It'll help the confidence of, of Gen Zers and young millennials everywhere in the world, which is our, our, our new acne product. The formulation we've developed for acne is the best we've seen from any clinical data we've reviewed and viewed the 10 best products in the market for acne, including the prescription drug products that doctors prescribe. We have a breakthrough formula. It is a problem that needs to be bettered for the world. And we yeah. are going to do that. We're going to do that with our Terrasana brands. So when I look at those three initiatives and those three brands and what they can do for the consumer, for our planet, and just the well-being of people's soul, uh, I don't know that I could be more excited. This is like the best year we've had. And you know, last year was the best year we had before then. And this is the this is the mode we're in. People, the, the consumer is doubling down on what we're doing. And the pandemic has made their conviction better than ever. Hmm. Well, I guess this goes back to what Beth was saying about the hyper growth. And so that's great to hear. We can hear your enthusiasm. I will say, Jay, I think we've done nearly 60 episodes. I think this is the first time that back acne has come up, <laughs> but agreed, serious issue. So I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, and this is exciting that you have so many new applications. Uh, where can listeners go to learn more about Amaris and all these different products? I think the, the best place to, to follow us is on our LinkedIn account and on our Twitter account. That's where you'll find kind of the breaking news. But the other thing that I wanted to point uh, your listeners' attention to is this mini series that we've been doing. So we've done two already. We have another one coming up. And they're kind of deep dives. One is just focused on our science and technology, and one is focused uh, just on our consumer brands and our consumer products. And uh, we have some slides, and it's um, it's uh, it's a webcast that we did. It's on our website, Amherst.com. And I think they would be good um, places to go to learn more about what Amherst is doing. I want to take us to our final question here. I want us to imagine that we are at a party with our favorite fermented products. And we're just <laughs> hanging out. And I want to share a party fact about biotechnology and sustainability. What would be that one party fact, that one stat I could throw out at this party that would cause people to drop their kombucha or whatever they got in their hand? Uh, we have the ability to make the, the adjuvant necessary, the turbocharger for 1 billion vaccines by using less sugarcane than uh, a little stamp size or 10% of Central Park. Wow. That's actually pretty crazy. So you're saying with the amount of sugar that is the size of a stamp relative to the entire side of Central Park, you're able to power an additional... 1 billion vaccines. Is that right? You got it. Goodness. That's something to chew on. <laughs> uh, and, and that is why we're working with the pharmaceutical industry to ensure that they've got plenty of access and that we speed up the production of squalene as an adjuvant and a lipid uh, to carry uh, RNA into the body, right? That's what we need to do. Well, I don't know what the permit is for Central Park, but if you could do some sort of activation there, just like rope off 10% of it. So that's all we need. <laughs> Keep enjoying the rest of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but regardless, let's end this conversation on a sweet note, shall we? And really, Beth and John, thanks so much for joining us for this conversation. It is It was truly mind-boggling for us to do this research and understand exactly not only the capabilities of, of biotech in general, but specifically and just in such a fascinating way how yeast can be such a powerful agent in achieving everything from perfumes to skincare to hair care. It is really pretty fascinating. And, and we are so excited to see what comes up for you guys over the next year, five years into the future. So again, thanks so much for joining us and for joining our definers. We will stay in touch and, and best of luck with these super ambitious and exciting goals. Yeah. Kudos to you for being so strategic and having, you know, this, this focus, this application and not compromising. Thanks, uh, Jay. Thanks, Scott. And uh, we are so glad you're on the ride with us. And uh, it's a ride worth being, right? Let's uh, let us accelerate the consumer transition to sustainable consumption, because then everyone in our future can enjoy some of the same things we love from nature. So have a great day, guys. Well said. All right. Thanks, John. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Thanks guys. Both.
All right, Scott, time to wrap this one up. This mm-hmm. episode has fully fermented. Oh, nice. Did we get kombucha out of it at the end? or? Yeah, even better, squalene. Oh, squalene's the best. Just as delicious. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> don't, I don't think it's meant to be drunk straight. Right. But... Well, moving right along. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So we want to extend our thanks to Keaton Butler for editing this episode. It's the beautiful piece of work you're listening to now. I want to thank Matt Ahrens for helping us out with our social media presence. And of course, thank Square Peg, Round Hole, and Potions for the music we use throughout the episode. Now, folks, if you could do us the favor, rate, review, and subscribe to our podcasts on iTunes. Although, Scott, to stay on point, it might become rate, review, and follow. Right. You heard it here first. Heard it here first. But for the time being, rate, review, subscribe, and we will be forever in gratitude. And as a little incentive to review, we actually read recent reviews on our episodes, and we got one. And February 28th, 2021, from Bill Nye 169. Maybe it's Bill Nye, Jay. B- uh, Bill, Bill, Bill. <laughs> Bill Nye titled his, I think it's a he, uh, his review, Sustainability for the Win! Exclamation point. Jay and Scott are great hosts who cover a wide array of thought-provoking sustainability topics. Their podcasts inspire me and motivate me to research the topics further. I love putting on this podcast any free moment I get, The podcast keeps my mind fixated on sustainability. I'm an architecture student at CU Denver. Huh, Jay? Denver. Hey. And incorporating sustainability into the built environment is a big passion of mine. These podcasts fill my thoughts with great solutions to problems I didn't even know existed. Jay and Scott's topics are always well-researched, and they objectively present information. They have top-tier experts weigh in on every topic, too. Yes, their jokes are bad, but their (laughs) podcast is good. I think we're stealing that tagline, Jay. Yes. I highly recommend episode 57 on energy storage. I'm going to be sad when I binge listen to every episode. Keep up the good work. Bill Nye 169. Bill Nye the science guy. Uh, you shouldn't have. <laughs> Amazing. All right. Well, that's great. And so we love these reviews, but also feel free to give us feedback anytime, good or bad. Hosts at sustainabilitydefined.com. H-O-S-T-S at sustainabilitydefined.com. We love hearing from listeners. So Jay, with that, I think that about does it. You all stay sustainable out there. I'm Scott Breen. And I'm Jay Siegel. We will see you next time.